Hello everyone, it's Benny, and welcome to part 7. Last time, we implemented the registers for our computer, and I claimed that today we'd be starting on the control logic. Upon further reflection, I've decided to hold off on that just a little bit longer. The reason being is we still have some core circuitry to implement, and at the end of the day, it's a lot easier to design your control logic to fit the core circuitry than it is to design the core circuitry to fit the control logic. So it's, just, it's a good idea to have as much of your core circuitry in place as reasonable before you start doing, well, a whole bunch of control logic. So today, we're going to be building the final key piece of the memory system for our computer, the cache. Now, I realize I haven't really explained what the big picture is with all these different memory components yet. I mean, the AOU, its purpose, at least, is pretty self-explanatory. It's the part of the computer that does all the math and logic that allows, well, computing to take place in the first place. But the whole memory system, why we need all these different levels and layers and parts to it, not quite so obvious why that needs to be, or what it's trying to achieve by doing it like that. So I'd like to take just a brief moment and run you through what the big picture of memory really is, and why we need these different components and layers that we have. So the purpose of memory as a whole, I think, is still reasonably self-explanatory. If the ALU is the part that actually processes data, then the memory is the part that stores all the data being processed. And that's fundamentally all memory achieves. The problem with this, and it's a very fundamental problem, is the problem of scale. Even in real life, ALUs only process a handful of bits at a time. And memory systems will typically have thousands, millions, billions of bits to choose from, to process with. And that huge mismatch in scale creates just a, a whole bunch of problems. Specifically, it creates three key problems. The first is a problem of size. If you have potentially billions of different bits, how are you going to store all of that in a reasonably small space? That's not a trivial issue. The second is an issue of speed. If I do have billions of bits, even if they are stored in a relatively small area, how could I access them in a reasonable time to process? How could I, say, grab this one piece of data I want, process it, and write it back? That's going to take a lot of time in any large memory system. And finally, the third and final key problem is accessibility. How do I go into this huge sea of potentially billions of bits and say, these are the bits I'm interested in right now, I'm also interested in these upper bits, and when you're done, I want you to overwrite these particular bits right here. That's also not exactly a trivial issue. So, trying to build a single system that solves all three of those problems is pretty close to impossible. And that's why no one builds just a single giant block of memory and tries to do everything at once with it. There's different layers and systems of memory that each do things a little bit differently and makes them a little bit better in some respects. And of course, the ultimate goal is to overcome enough of those key problems, enough of the time, so that overall it's not a big problem. So, at the bottom of our memory hierarchy, farthest from the actual processing, is RAM. And since this is going to be the final, ultimate level of memory, obviously the key thing this is addressing is size. How do we store this potentially huge number of bits 
in a reasonably small space. And it will do this very much at the expense of speed and accessibility. It's going to pretty much be slow no matter what you do, and it's going to be a little bit difficult to access. So that's the bottom. And this is good because it means we have plenty of memory to work with. It's bad because chances are it's not going to be nearly fast enough to keep the processor fed with information. And even if it could, the processor would have to do a whole bunch of work to make sure it was accessing the right part of memory. So good because it stores a whole bunch of data and keep, gives us plenty of room to work with. Not so good for actually directly accessing and working with. So at the top of the hierarchy is what we just built, the registers. And this pretty much tries to address that very problem. It, the registers try and be as fast and accessible as possible at the cost of not having a lot of size to them. So pretty much the polar opposite of what RAM tries to do. So the ALU can typically access registers and write back to them really quickly, sometimes even in the same cycle, and usually it can access them really easily too. Often you can directly mention in a register by name in the processor instruction to read or write from. So very fast to access, well yeah, very fast to access, very easy to access, the problem being that because it's trying to do these two things so well, it's often impractical to have too many of them. Our, our computer, for example, only has seven, and that's actually not too, too far off from what you see in real computers. You don't usually see a whole vast array of registers. So, yeah, you have these two extremes of memory in the memory hierarchy. Now, you could build a computer that only has registers and RAM in its memory system, and it would work. The problem is, if you did that, your computer would constantly be moving between two sort of almost comical extremes of memory performance. On one hand, if everything can fit in the register, then your computer is moving at maximum speed. Okay, it's just constantly going, registers, ALU, registers, ALU, really insanely fast. And But... It's doing this in a way that crams everything you're trying to work with into this itty bitty space that can only fit in the registers, constantly doing a whole bunch of processing to keep it crammed in that tiny space. Why? Because the second you have to go outside the registers, even by a single byte, you jump into the second comical extreme of memory processing, where the data is in the RAM. Now this has plenty of space to store all the data you could possibly want to work with and it's slow. Your computer tries to read from memory, and it waits. It idles, wasting a whole bunch of processing cycles, doing absolutely nothing, while data slowly moves to the RAM, slowly comes all the way back, taking its time, then it hits, and bam, right back to comical extreme number one, where it's going insanely fast, ALU registers, until the second has to spill over again, where it jumps right back to comical slowness. And it, it's really ridiculous. It is truly outrageous. And I'm sure you can see, this is not, it's not how you want your computer to perform. This is not desirable. And that's why, even though, strictly speaking, you don't need it, it's a good idea to have some middle ground between registers and RAM. And that's what the cache is. Now what the cache does, in terms of function, is it acts like a mirror stores the contents of RAM for a few select addresses close to the processing unit. So as long as the ALU tries to access addresses that are in the cache, then that's almost as fast as working with the registers. So you get a little bit of that extra space you get with RAM without sacrificing too much of the speed you get with registers. It's like an excellent middle ground. And another really cool thing about the cache is that once, you're di once you have certain addresses cached, you know in advance that at some point in the relatively near future, 
you're going to need to access those addresses in actual RAM, either to write back to them because, say, you're evicting the cache line or whatever, or basically you know you're going to need to access it for one reason or another. So you can pre-compute some of the more complicated RAM access and save a little bit of time there, and it makes memory access that much faster when you do go to RAM. So, bottom line, it helps a lot to have some form of cache. It lets you, it gives you more flexibility in processing, it lets you parallelize some of the memory processing, it's, it's good, it helps. And this is what we're going to be building in this video. Alright, let's start building our cache. Now first and foremost, the cache is going to be able to save data from the ALU and read it back out as an ALU input. And that's basically what our registers do. So we're going to start by building what's essentially more registers, and then from there we're going to start adding some more cachey things to it, for lack of a better term. So to start out, this is where we're eventually going to need to send our output of the cache so it can be used as an ALU input. So I'm going to start here with a repeater. And I'm going to say this right here is the output bus of our cache. When we read data from the cache, it's going to go along this bus. And right here is going to be our read mechanism. So this comparator is going to determine whether or not we're reading a particular piece of cache memory or not. And we're going to use a repeater lock to, well, to store the data in the cache. That's going to be our main mechanism. And we'll also need to take the ALU output and send it along the input bus to the cache in case we want to save to some something in the cache. So this right here is the inverted ALU output. If I just take a torch and uninvert that, look at that. This is now going along the bus for our cache. So there we go. This is the core, I guess, piece of the register part of the cache. So I'm going to turn this repeater lock memory into, well, I'm just going to add the right line, and not a sign. I'm going to add another slab here, and there. So this will be the slab tower, where we can lock all of the memory at once. And this right here is going to be our read mechanism, done by a similar thing. And there's a reason I'm doing the power like this, where it's sort of, you know, two wires instead of one. And I'll show you in just a second, but first I want to set up the slab tower. And cool. So essentially we've just built another register. If I invert the lines for a moment, this acts exactly like a register. I can send data along, I can save it with the repeater lock, and I can read it back out with this. Something you'll notice though, because we have one wire here, this repeater loses one signal strength before it goes into the comparator. So we have a signal strength of one here if a one is saved in the, uh, in the in this piece of cache memory. I'll call it the cache register, just to give it a name. So if the cache register has a one save, this will have a one signal strength output, which we could repeat and use for some logic, like say, preparing this to be sent to RAM, for instance. Or if it has a zero, whoops, if it has a zero, then it's nothing. So this is nice. This way we can know what's in all of our cache registers without actually reading from them. And that'll come in handy as we start building more of this. But for now I want to unwrite to this and break these, because I'm going to stack this. So I'm going to set this to position 1, and this to position 2, and expand 1 down, and I actually think that should capture everything. So I think I can stack 7 down from here. And awesome, now we have one complete 8-bit cache register. We just need to turn this off. And there. So I'm going to turn these to solid blocks, set this as a torch, and this will be our write, the write command for this cache register. And over here, I'm going to go up here, again, torch for the read command in the cache register. 
So awesome. This is one 100% complete and working cash register. I just need to take say right here, position one, and I'll fly all the way down here, position two. I should be able to stack this three times before I run out of signal strength. So if I turn this off for a moment, yeah, that reaches everything, which is good, that's what I want. Now, something I want to point out at this point. Let's count how long it takes data to move from our ALU back to the input through the register. There's one tick for this torch, then it goes one, one tick here, so two ticks, three ticks, four ticks, five ticks, and at that point it's heading back into the here. So five ticks from ALU output back to this part of the input through a register. Now through the cache register, one tick, two ticks, three ticks, four ticks, five ticks. And at that point, it's back at this repeater again. So, in theory, if as long as the data is in the cache registers, it should be just as fast as if it's in the normal registers. Which, if you ask me, is really, really cool. If we wanted to, we could just say, screw the cache, we're going to have an extended register system, which instead of having seven registers, has 13, and it won't cost us any extra delay. I'm not going to do that, I'm going to have a cache, but still. I wanted to point that out, because I think that's kind of cool. Also, while I'm here, I want to make sure, yeah, that reaches all the way there, so no signal strength issues. Awesome. Alright, so that's just about everything I wanted to cover in this video. We've got a nice set of cache registers set up, and really, this is going to be the core functionality of the cache. The only other part we're going to need is we're going to need some way to send all of the contents of the cache register to memory, and some way to load a certain piece of memory to all of the cache registers. And that's what we're going to tackle in the next video. Thank you, hope you enjoyed, Hope you learned, and I'll see you next time.